white people are still looked upon as the, you know, as maybe descendants of this sun that went across the water. And the reason why native people are very, are very tolerant and have tolerated a lot of things that this sun, you know, or descendants of this sun have done. But in the long run, they still say, well, maybe there are relatives. There was a kind of contest of cruelty. They came to conquer, and caught in this war of empires were always the Indians. The Spanish were probably the most savage, attempting their own style of war against the Indians. The Spanish succeeded in planting settlements in North America during the 16th century, but the English and the French succeeded only with the help of the Indian cures. These are the words of George Sewee. It was just a, a natural uh, gesture that the uh, Indians made and which would, they would have towards any, any group of people. Um, they noticed that these people had, uh, they were suffering from some kind of uh, lack of fresh uh, nutrients fresh food and they, um, they pulled out uh, bark from, uh, from a cedar tree or probably from a white spruce tree and uh, they, they used up the bark of a big tree in little time and they cured these people. Sir Walter Raleigh founded a colony of Roanoke and it vanished. Smith tried again at Jamestown and then the pilgrims and with them the Europeans brought disease. The righteous Puritans thought of the plague as a sign that God was on their side, and one of them still mourned. The bones and skulls made such a spectacle that as I traveled in that forest near Massachusetts, it seemed to me a newfound Golgotha. The priests came to harvest souls, the explorers to find wealth. When we refer back to 1609, we can say that the divisions that were opposing uh, uh, the alliance of tribes uh, sided with the French, which were, which were, who were the, the, the Huron and the Algonquins, and on the other side, uh, the Iroquois, was uh, getting intensified, this division. So Champlain s knew that uh, he had to play on that division. There was a skirmish. Um, Champlain right at once noticed or commented that the, the Indians didn't know anything about war, didn't know how to fight, because they wouldn't uh, comply with his orders. And he says, I'm, I'm the commandant here, uh, why aren't they listening to me? But the Indians were not willing to go and expose themselves and uh, just uh, assault this, uh, this fortress. So, and they were mainly fighting by their own modes of warfare which was to, to hide themselves and try to capture someone. But uh, Champlain urged them to, and qualified them with being very bad warriors and not knowing anything about war from that point on. And he took uh, other opportunities afterwards to, to lead battles against the Iroquois. And the Iroquois from that moment on had a very serious uh, grudge against the French. They had the, a much stronger reason to resist alliance with the French and to turn towards the English or the Dutch, which were the people then. We know that uh, the diseases started striking almost at the same instant that the Jesuits came back in force in 1634. So this is a, more than a coincidence. Uh, the, the Indians themselves made a direct and very quick, uh, quickly made a relation between the presence of the priests and the spreading of epidemics. The uh, supposed innocence of the, of the priests is a little more tarnished because we see that they are rejoicing, openly rejoicing, when large numbers of people succumb to the epidemics. They say, uh, well, among the, the Peter, Tionontati, uh, the harvest is good. The harvest of souls is good. The, uh, the people are dying uh, in, in good numbers there. They didn't succeed in converting or baptizing people in good health until very late in the relationship they had with the Wandat. 
they mostly baptize the uh, dying infants or dying people, but they complain themselves uh, very often that they had not yet, as, I think as late as 1641, converted or baptized one adult in good health. The holy passion for conversion would lead the black robes, as they were called, to face any danger as they headed inland to build a frozen paradise in the distant woods. The Huron knew well how to survive in the cruel climate of Canada, and the Jesuits, in their search for souls, built a village for their new Christians at St. Marie. Within its barricades, they were segregated from the Hurons. Outside, the traditional opponents of the Hurons, the Iroquois. The Jesuits thought they had built an unconquerable fortress for Jesus. When you're in this place, it's so peaceful now. Yes. What, what do you feel when you see this graveyard here? You know, I actually feel that these people are listening to me. That's what I really, really feel. They're hearing me and they have something that they want me to say. And this is important for me to be here. These are all here on graves for the most they part? They are. For the most part, they say 21 people, so this would account for most of them, yeah. So when they talk here about the martyrs, they're talking about, of course, the Jesuits. Yes. There's almost no talk. No. Of what happened to the native people here? It's correct, Harry. You hardly ever mentioned them, just like they hadn't been the, as human as the as the other people. The Iroquois that came here finally in 1649 to destroy this place, they were mainly composed of uh, one that traditionalist who had fed to the Iroquois or had been incorporated somehow by force or but more by their own will with the Iroquois and were teaching the Iroquois to be aware of what had happened and that the same design was up, was in the minds of the missionaries for, for the Iroquois also. The people that have actually committed uh, the murders, if, can, if we want to call it, call them murders, uh, against those priests were uh, what the priests have termed Huron renegades. That means people who had uh, suffered the loss of their country here, had, that had found some salvation among the Iroquois, who were the pagans in the last analysis in the Indians, in the Jesuits' words, and had uh, urged their adopters to come in and, and destroy, because they, coming from here, they knew that the same destruction was heading out for Iroquois, the Iroquois country. So they, uh, they didn't uh, really uh, torture these priests in, in any honorable way in the, uh, in the mentality or in the context. Uh, the, uh, the one that suffered the longest to martyrdom was Father Brebeuf. The others were uh, dispatched uh, by blows of a hatchet. Apparently they, they ate his heart because he had uh, shown them a lot of courage because uh, this priest uh, had come here with the express intent of dying here, martyrdom. They chose to interpret that God willed all these people to, uh, to disappear because God had other plans for this land. They did, he wanted to wipe out savagery from this land here and that uh, conversion would only come when so many people, which meant most of the people had died. And there died about two-thirds of the original population, which means uh, at least 20,000 people. And it's, uh, it's more than catastrophe. It's, uh, it's death of a people. It's genocide. Oh, they are scattered. But his spirit, it lingers on. So, a great nation, the Hurons perished, the Iroquois grew strong, the white man moved west, and a way of life 
was destroyed. The Battle of Empires will be fought also with Indian blood, maneuvering tribe against tribe. It is September 13, 1759. Two champions will die on the Plains of Abraham, creating three solitudes. The fur traders and settlers head west, assuming it to be, of course, empty space. The living Indian culture is ignored or destroyed. Progress is a kind of punishment for guiding hands. It was convenient to think of all Indians as savages, and thus, progress, European style, was of course an advantage. The settlers working their way west simply ignored the tribes if they could. If you were going to a land, a beautiful land, and try to take that, you would have to condemn the culture there, the language, everything they did because we're superior and will replant that and do away with the savages and make a, uh, almost a utopia there, you know. When possible, they used native skills once they had taken their lands in the east. And this was the case of Phil Fontaine's family. He's the grand chief of the assembly of Manitoba chiefs. They had moved westward with the, uh, with the trade. They were the canoe. Uh, they were the paddlers. They were the, you know, they did the work. And so uh, anyone that moved out here uh, moved pretty well in the same way. If, if they didn't come with the church, they came with the, with the fur trade. This area was noted for its prime uh, stands of birch. So it is a place where our people and, and others would congregate to uh, repair their canoes or uh, uh, build new canoes. And uh, during the height of the fur trade, of course, uh, a good place for, uh, uh, because it is a departure point for, for pemmican, the pemmican supplies that moved uh, out to see with, uh, with the traders and the Indians that, uh, uh, that worked on the, on, the, on the fur trade. There was fierce competition in our area between the Norwest Company, the Hudson's Bay, and the free traders, and, and the churches. You had smallpox uh, uh, and other diseases, and uh, I recall reading about uh, some of the epidemics uh, that would move just so quickly, you know, through the, uh, through the, uh, the uh, lake. You know, and most of our people, of course, if not all, live by, the, by water. You know, the Winnipeg River, Lake Winnipeg, and any, any waterway, as that was their way of, of traveling. The settlers brought with them the animals that could change the ways of the Plains Indians, caught in paint by Gerald McMaster, a Cree. Uh, when, when people think of Indians, they think of horses. It seems to be just a part of... Uh, Immediately, of, yes. Yeah. Um, we call them Mistatim, or big dog. And I felt that uh, when I was thinking about the term Mistatim, um, as you know, or at least archaeologists uh, inform us that uh, uh, they have actually found skeletons of, of uh, an animal the size of a dog, you know, with uh, cloven hooves or, or, or a hoof, uh, not cloven hoof, but rather a hoof, uh, which existed uh, in prehistoric times. And I think that they felt that the horse obviously disappeared, but you know, whether or not it, it actually went back uh, towards Europe that way through the Bering Strait, it's unknown. But anyhow, there was, there was uh, an indication by archaeologists that a horse existed. So in fact, that the horse may have existed here and could be in an old term from way back then, but uh, so you have this return of the horse, return of the big dog, and uh, it completely changed the lifestyle of uh, my ancestors overnight. And the Sioux Indian is, is uh, the most popular Indian in all the world. <laughs> and um, so that was the image that, that I saw. And primarily it was, it was they that wore this uh, peculiar looking headdress with uh, feathers arranged in the circle and they wore it on the head. And there are 
numerous native tribes around Canada and the United States that uh, have adopted this, this feathered headdress format, maybe not out of eagle feathers, but uh, out of feathers. There is a hierarchy of birds, and, and, and the eagle represents the highest on the, this hierarchy. And that uh, because the eagle flies the highest, the eagle uh, then in turn represents it being the closest to the great spirit or to the spiritual realm. And so that's why it becomes important, because it's believed that an eagle also is a messenger and carries your, your uh, thoughts and that and prayers. When the settlers come in, the, the Europeans come in, they hunted the buffalo for the hides. The hides were worth a hundred dollars back in them days. And they were selling them down east to factories where they use them for belt drives, according to what they were telling me. There were so many buffalo that there was just like a sports, uh, uh, where the white people hunt them for game. Some took the heads for trophies, but most of it, the meat was wasted out on the land. They figured if they do away with the buffalo, so will they do away with the Indian, because that's the Indian's main source of food, his main source of clothes, his main source of his teepee. But the Indian, he's still here, the Blackfeet Indian is still here to tell the story of the history of his people, how he survived from the beginning and right up to the present day. Today he's still here and I'm proud to talk about my people and how he survived in this buffalo jump which you see here today. The Indian, he respects the land. Mother Earth is where your body comes from. 